Welcome to Legacy Conversations, a channel where we preserve military memories and history. Hello, Legacy viewers. Welcome here. We're glad to see you again. I have something very interesting for you. I've been thinking a long time to, to make this video. And it's between Major Grain from Israeli Defense Force speaking to uh, Captain Andre Urendal or Five Ricky. And uh, Andre actually went to the IDF. So the second part of a, of a program is speaking about Andre's experiences in the, in the IDF, how he found it. And the first part is when Graham is asking questions about border war from the Israeli army perspective. There's certain things we did which he found highly puzzling. And they would have done it differently. Of course, every army in the world would have done it differently. That's why there's different armies. They, they have different ways of doing things. And I'm sure that if we were ever in the Middle East, uh, we would have totally a different uh, look to the army. I mean, the army which we had at the border was geared towards that border. That's why you had the equipment, you had the long range artillery, you had the uh, rattles moving fast and at twice, twice the distance of any uh, compatible or comparable uh, NATO equipment, uh, the long range of these vehicles is, is something else. And a really small tail, which is also something which is, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, forgive my voice, I've still got a bit of a flu here, uh, which is also unique to the South African Army. Uh, so, so this is interesting, this is a fascinating one. And I want to welcome our two guests, and I want to uh, thank them for taking the time. And uh, that's it. Let us hear what, what they have to say. Okay, Andre, so uh, would you like to start off and uh, just tell everyone uh, what your background is? Yeah, sure. So I um, I spent uh, seven years in the South African Army after uh, getting called up when I was 18, and then uh, after that, I wanted to stay in the military. I didn't really want to go into the private military consulting, so I kind of looked for a military that I kind of aligned with. You know, sort of my my kind of values. I wanted to serve in a, a, a military that was like highly capable. And I, so then I spent a lot of time in Israel getting into the Israeli army. I got into the Israeli army eventually, but it wasn't uh, full time. I did a six month um, um, citizen force call up, what they call citizen force in. South Africa and what you call Miluim in, in Israel. And and that was my experience. So it was just coming from a very low level, like Shlav Bet, which is level like tier two, tier three. And then and then I did a tier one section leaders course with a bit of um, operational experience in the West Bank in between. So that is that is that is my experience. And All right. And and for for the I'm I'm assuming there would be very few viewers who would not know what your South African background is. Perhaps you just for the yes. benefit if you'd like to yes. mention. So South African background, it's actually interesting because I, I started on a tier tier two, tier three. I started in the medics and then went to infantry and infantry school after the medics jails and then went to um, a more elite reaction force unit with the Bushmen and then served in the South African Special Forces in Five Reiki, which is, you know, the, the sort of most elite unit in the South African Army at the time. Yeah. And I, I, I left as a captain. So I was um, I was I was an officer. Right. Okay, so um, with regards to me, so I um, went into the infantry at age 20 in Israel um, after having been in the country for two years and not uh, knowing much Hebrew at the time. Um, I started off in the Golani Brigade, which is uh, one of Israel's infantry brigades. And um, I did a squad commander's course, which uh, would be the equivalent of qualifying you as a corporal in the South African army. And immediately straight after that, I went off to do an infantry officer's course. And um, following on from that, I was in um, sort of mechanized infantry, which became um, um, armored reconnaissance. So in the Israeli army, in armored brigades, each armored brigade used to have a company of, uh, you could, I guess you could call them infantrymen, but they specialized in in reconnaissance, not recce in the South African sense, but uh, sort of reconnaissance, battlefield reconnaissance, uh, where we used to, we had three main missions. One was to, um, if uh, formations of armor or logistics had to be taken from point A to point B, and so they wouldn't have to navigate, we would lead them. 
And uh, another thing we used to do is also before a, a, a body of armor would travel from point A to point B, if it would happen at night, we would mark the route for them. Um, using uh, the Israeli army doctrine for marking a route. We would also collect battlefield intelligence within the brigade, the brigade operational area. Um, we were the eyes and the ears of the brigade. We would be reporting directly to the brigade intelligence officer, who was our ad hoc commander at the time when we were doing that mission. So we'd set up OPs all over the place and um, and um, provide uh, the, the eyes and ears for the brigade that way. And the last mission, which we only trained for, thank we, thankfully we never used, was um, uh, to detect chemical warfare, which had been used, which would have been used against us. Uh, we would have to um, analyze the chemicals and say what kind of uh, chemical agent had been used against us. And um, yeah, we, we always had the view that if we ever had to do that, we, <laughs> it wouldn't be a good day for us because the... I, I'm not sure how how suitable equipment that we had, the protective yeah. equipment was. I I think maybe uh, just as well we never had to do that. So uh, that was that. So I did that for quite a few years, also into the reserves. So which in South Africa you call the citizen force. I was in a formation like that. We we were a, a, like a citizen force company which belonged to a regular armored brigade, which is um, it's always a recipe for a lot of tension and friction and and and. Um, there's a lot of frustration involved for both sides when in that arrangement, and it's uh, ultimately the brig they did away with us. They replaced us with a regular company because it just it just doesn't work. The two citizen force and regular army in Israel anyway they talk totally different languages and they yep, don't yep. often they don't get on well together. So um, after that we uh, I, I went on to an infantry, back to an infantry brigade, and uh, that infantry brigade had a reconnaissance battalion, which was made up of a, a sappers a company, a anti-tank company, and a re reconnaissance company. And the reconnaissance company was, um, it would be like, you know, I'm trying to think of the equivalent in South African Army, it would be like 3-2 like recce or something like that. It wasn't like the the recce's like Andre, where you were. Um, it was sort of at a lower level, like tactical special forces, you might say. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was the operations officer of that battalion. And then at some point, I was I was getting a bit too old for this sort of thing. And um, then I went off and did a course to be a kind of a forward air controller. Um, but I would not be in sort of with the the frontline troops. I would be I would be sitting in the brigade headquarters at what's called the fires table. And um, or in the divisional headquarters, with with in what's called the fire center, and those those two entities are responsible for pro providing fire support for the formation. And uh, I was involved in the coordinating mainly airstrikes with the air force. So that that was my background. Uh, a bit long winded, but there we go. Yeah. Um, so what we thought of doing, and hopefully this will be of interest to the viewers, is. Um, I, I, I've i read a bit about this this South African army campaign in, in Angola, and I had a few questions that that I'd always wanted to ask someone who, who was uh, sort of well, well qualified to answer, and Andre, I think you definitely fit the bill for that. One of the things I noticed, one of the central aspects of the border war was the loss of air superiority, which happened to the South African Air Force from uh, roughly the mid 1980s and, and onwards um the reason for that was that the the cuban air force operating in gala uh, received what's called an all aspect uh, short range air to air missile which means that the aircraft can attack targets from any any direction and the south african air force had missiles which could only be used if the south african aircraft was behind the enemy aircraft and the and and the missile seeker could see the heat of the engine of the enemy aircraft. Yeah. Um, but the Angolans or the Cubans could shoot these missiles from any direction. Yeah. So so yeah. this is a so it just became like too dangerous for the South African Air Force. So um, I, I in reading a bit about the history, I saw that um, the there were two occasions when this when the South Africans attacked Angolan airfields. So one. I did a bit of research here. So the one was in 1985 when 3-2 Battalion used uh, 
the Vol Vol Valkyrie, I don't Valkyrie. know how you pronounce it, yep. Valkyrie, Valkyrie uh, yeah. Ro yeah. Uh, multiple yeah. uh, launch rocket system. So they sh they used those on Manong airfield. Yep. And I'm just going to um, share my screen here with, I've got a, a map, just a sec. Okay, so there's Manong over there. So the, yep. this was 3-2 Battalion. There's an Air Force base, an Angolan Air Force base here at Manong. There was also an Air Force base here at uh, Quito Cunavale. And there was another Air Force base at this place here. I guess you pronounce this uh, Quito, yep. I don't know, whatever. Yep. Yep. And yep. another one here at, at Huambo. Yep. And then the the next ones would have been further north at um, Luanda. Yeah. So so there was the one case in 1985 when this one here at Manong was attacked, and then on the 5th of June 1986. Um, oh no, excuse me, that's a different thing. On the 9th of August 1986, uh, G5 artillery was used against the airfield at Quito Cunovale, and the I think it was five recce. Uh, did this artillery spotting for that. They actually directed the artillery fire on, on the Air Force base at Quito, Quito Conavale. So yep. um, there were two cases where the Air Force bases were attacked. And my my, I just wondered why a more concerted effort wasn't made to attack those airfields, either using artillery um, or mortars, or just by recce attacks, like similar to what the the British SAS did in the Second World War in the in the Egyptian and Libyan deserts when they used to attack German airfields. Yeah, um, yeah, this they, is like a, yeah, yeah. No, they, there's a couple of things, and I, and like I'm not an expert on this at all, but uh, I mean, you look at the the ranges; they're pretty vast. And Quito and Monongo is like on the edge of the envelope of where we were deployed. I mean, I did some operations. Kind of west of Kasinga there that that's and that was like way out you know so it's pretty high up yeah, yeah. so um the issues were yeah we could attack the air force bases there but they had a lot of death right so you know like i said quito and 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 huambo and those places are pretty far up it is really hard for us to get in that far you know and but then what i understood at the time when i was there was the actual you know the, the sam missiles were a huge issue as well you know that sam sixes and they were pretty mobile and it was hard to get them pinned down so you had this whole missile you know capability right. going right up from the, from the yeah you know, right up from the border and and the the rumor at the time was that it was like one of the most complex miss missile infrastructures outside of you know the soviet union on its own they spent a lot of effort there and they they did have east germans um and, and more advanced folks in there that were that were setting this up so i think our our appetite for risk was very low because we couldn't replace stuff, you know, particularly on our on our jets. We we had no we had no backup where whereas they did. So I mean if they lost the aircraft they they could still get them replaced. And and they had these um uh, these foreign pilots. We were really limited to that. So that that's right. kind of so, where we were where, where we were, yeah. Um so, 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 so cool. Yeah. So the, look the idea, I mean whether or not it was feasible, like the sort of the uh, the reasoning behind it would be if these two bases at Manong and Quito Conavale were denied to the Cubans, and this one at Quito was denied to the Cubans. They stopped using yeah. it after that G five yeah. attack on them. Yeah. Um, then they would have they would be forced to use bases up here at Huambo and uh, sorry, this other one here at uh, Quito, Quito yeah. or whatever you call yeah. that. Yeah. So uh, I mean, then the their range to get south, further south, uh, they would be, a lot of this operational area here where the South Africans were would now be denied to them because they just didn't. It was too yeah. far for them to fly. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So. Look, I guess I guess my assumption would be that either it was too difficult to attack these two ones consistently and sort of totally deny them these two bases, and and also the Sams. I guess I don't know to, how how many there were of these Sam batteries, but I don't know well, if if the batteries could have been attacked by the Rekis. We we, we did. We actually batteries? kept we actually captured some, and we had some operations where we did ambushes using those those sam uh, missiles so it did happen but you know also i think part of the problem was also politically like we had to you know withdraw from so sometimes we were completely out of angola then we had to go all the way back in so it was like this this constant in and out so you know it wasn't it wasn't as if we were like occupying you know that area right. permanently so i think it's pretty hard to to, to so deal you couldn't with that sort of time. keep a consistent uh, yeah. pressure on the yeah. on the yeah yeah. 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 I, I mean, I Quito Cuernavala built up, and there was massive battles and stuff going on there, and it stayed for a long time. But you know, we were pretty 
flexible. And we, you know, the, all our operations were this massive invasion in, do operation attack a base, and then and then withdraw. So it wasn't it wasn't occupying, holding occupying, territory. Yeah, yeah, holding territory. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I understand. Right. Um, and now the other thing I wanted to ask you about was that um, reading about the history of the Iraqi operations in, in Angola in the 1980s, it, it, my impression was that many of these operations, the Iraqi operations, were not conducted as part of um, the other counterinsurgency operations that the conventional South African army was yeah. doing. For example, yeah. operations Protea, Ascari, uh, Daisy, all of those. So just to put that into context, the, the, the Soviet army has a doctrine uh, that they call deep battle. So with deep with that doctrine, they say that uh, the fight must not only go, must not only occur along the, the contact line with the, with the enemy forces, the battle must be taken into the rear and into the deep rear. So literally hundreds of kilometers behind the front line. Um, the Soviets talk about using special forces to to attack the enemy, the logistical rear, uh, the deep logistics. Um, and in, in many cases, the South Africans did this. Um, I know that they did it uh, on the railway line uh, here between Namib and Lubango yep. and, yep, and yep. further on. And there were yep. all sorts of raids like that. There was a raid on the harbor in Namib yep. Yep. and things like that. But that, that it never happened as part of a... Say, for example, as part of Operation Protea or, or part of Operation um, Ascari. Or then there was Operation Kerslich. I think that was in uh, in Namib, in the harbor. So Operation Kerslich, was, it happened all by itself. It wasn't part of another effort that maybe was going on somewhere else for the South African army. It wasn't in support of another operation. And it just struck me as odd. Now, it might be a, a, a mistaken impression on my part. I don't know. You Perhaps you can correct me and, and, and tell me if the uh, if the special South African Special Forces were used in support of the, the greater army, or was this one sort of Special Forces effort going on totally disconnected to the main conventional yeah, counterinsurgency it's, it's, operations? It, it's a good question, and it... Uh, um... I kind of think in context you got to the conflict that we were fighting was there was three conflicts really right so there was there was the conflict in South Africa against the ANC which so involved basically all the southern african states were basically enemy states so we had the conflict against the ANC we had the conflict in Angola from a from a, a counter insurgency perspective so that is fighting against Swapo and then we had the more conventional conflict against the Angolan government and you know support, in support of UNITA so we had these three three initiatives going on of which you know the rec is like you're talking about maybe you know a couple of hundred operatives ever you know at, at any time so it's not that many um having to you know to kind of deal with all these things and we we reported directly to the head head of the defense force so or the head of the army so he kind of used us as he wanted to kind of thing so he you know yeah there were raids but there were also raids into Mozambique and Zimbabwe, you know, taking out ANC uh, people. So there were, yeah, there was multiple, multiple initiatives going on, uh, as well as the initiatives in support of, you know, just the anti, anti counter, counter insurgency swapo, swapo stuff. So it is kind of spread pretty thin. Um, uh, and I think, you know, when you mentioned some of the, like three two Reiki and those, they were actually tier one uh, reconnaissance uh, uh, teams and they, they, they did a lot of the, um, they did a lot of the um, conventional stuff as well, so they they were they were helping out with the reconnaissances there. But then again, also you know you for those conventional attacks it going the the terrain it's such vast terrain and so inhospitable it's really hard to get in there. And then locals, you know, if they hear a helicopter or a vehicle, they know. So that you know it's either the the the, the the, the infiltration is possible, but the exfiltration is really hard. So it is really difficult to bring people in to do that. And we had a couple of operations, and we lost we lost a lot of operatives. And I think it was decided not to risk people, you know, in in that kind of co conflict. So it was kind of, yeah, you're right. It wasn't this. But I mean, if you if you look at your map and you look at the Kabrivi Strip, that's that's the size of Israel, right? And and yeah. you had this whole vast continent that you that you <laughs> that we involved in. So it is, it is pretty vast for such a a small country of you know maybe you know uh you know army i can't even remember what what size army we had maybe a hundred thousand i can't even remember what what our actual 
strength was. So it's pretty, pretty daunting, you know, operations to be carrying out for. And, 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 but I think you're right. I don't think we were always 100% strategically involved. And I don't think we always, there was a co complete strategic effort all the time uh, um, because of political things too. We, we had, I know we were being supported by, you know, the CIA and we were being supported by, the intelligence services from time to time, but then they would also put pressure on us to stop, you know, so we're constantly being pressurized not to do things and do things. And sometimes we could go over the border when we wanted to, sometimes we were in Angola, other times we were, you know, so it is very really difficult to be consistent in, from a military perspective, I think, you know. Right. Understood. Okay. Um, then I wanted to ask you about the, the Cuban army. So, um, in reading, uh, sort of reading between the lines about the history, and the, here again, please correct me if my impression is mistaken. But I, um, I, I was interested in two things in this uh, about the Cubans and the other forces, perhaps East Germans or Soviets or whoever was there, whether they were advisors or actual military formations that were sent to fight. Um, there, there seemed to be a kind of a, relax, a reluctance or a, a concern about having the South African army meeting these uh, more sort of advanced um, Cuban or East German soldiers on the battlefield, as if it was it was almost dreaded. Like I remember at the there was that time at the towards the end of the Bush War when the Cubans uh, made a big move down here. I think it was towards Rokana, yep, some, yep, somewhere yep. around here. I think yep. you were involved in that as well. Yep, yep. And there, there seemed to be when I read about that, my impression was that there was this, there was it was sort of seen as a dire threat, and and the South African army was, the, when I say the South African army, I mean the high command was terribly concerned about this, and it was like, uh, it it they they weren't relishing the contact. Let's put it that way. To to you know to sort of uh, explain what I'm trying to say. So yeah. my question is: Is was there really a reluctance to meet those um, East Germans and Cubans no, on the battlefield in a clash? No, in, in the in the opposite. I think uh, I think everybody from three two or you know uh, special force or whatever. That's who we were looking for. So I think it was almost like because we did actually we captured we captured um, we did capture Russian. Um, we captured Russians. We captured a lot of Cubans, and uh, I, I think it was kind of like that—that that was the the prize, right? I don't think there was ever, ever, ever that at all. I think I think the opposite. It was kind of like seen as like, okay, now you know this is this is proper, you know, proper combat, and and uh, no, there, there definitely wasn't. I think I think we were all very interested in coming across the Cubans, and you're right. I was involved in that. I I, I mean, the formations of tanks came past me personally. I was like up there, and and. Um, yeah, that was never the worry. It was, I mean, yeah, I, I think the the high commander was worried because of the proximity of how close they were getting to the border, and it was coming up to Namibia was going to get, you know, go for independence, and all, all those talks were happening. And I think they were really worried about the actual pressure on on Namibia or South West Africa at the time from such a big force. So there was, and then they had to mobilize. You know, we'd have to mobilize our conventional forces, which a lot of them were national services. So I think. I think I think you're right in the in the fact that the South African military did not like losing national servicemen, you know, particularly white national servicemen, um, and uh, the, because you know the the whole public opinion would be really against that, uh, and and we just had limited resources when it came to you know three two battalion one oh one Kufut and special forces to hold back such a big force. So I think that's what it really yeah. was, but now from a from a uh, let's let's get involved with them. Not at all. I think it was the opposite. We we really you know, we were actually looking for and guys would get excited if they saw saw you know like Cubans or or you know what they thought might be East Germans. Uh, we talk about it a lot. Yeah. Right. I see. Okay. So um, with, with with those Cubans and East Germans, did they ever use their own special forces? And did you ever come across them? Not not operationally. I don't think they did. I think they their special forces were training you know in a in a training capacity but they never did missions against us or actually tried any operations against us no i don't think so no no right and did you need to have their own special forces and, and yeah. if they did did you what were you, what was your impression of them the special forces i mean, I, I never worked with the unita special forces but they were trained by us and by three two uh, so they and, and they would have been trained you know in our in our in our uh training facilities so i would think the 
the quality of of the guys would have been good uh, but i never worked with you need a special forces as much um just more the regular you need guys uh which look like, varying varying levels of quality right um, but yeah but i mean we we also had you know limited we bring guys through training cycles and everything but you know you can only train so so many when we're there trying to train us up as well so but yeah they um, i think three two helped a lot there and and special forces we did we did do cycles for them too yeah okay andre and and um so as we mentioned in the beginning of the podcast you uh had some experience in the israeli army now assuming that you had been able to have a complete influence over over events there and you were able to um, make changes or suggest changes to the Israelis in light of your experience and knowledge, what were the things that you think that uh, the Israelis would have done well to adopt? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think uh, one of the things that surprised me, you know, you talk about the regular army. Um, one of the things that surprised me there was there are no regular fighters. You know, no, there were no regular units of, apart from the guys doing their, you know, their three-year, three-year or four-year training you didn't have permanent force units like we had so we had a mixture we had the citizen force and then we had permanent force so you had units where average age would be guys in their late 20s early 30s as soldiers you know so and, and that was their career and i think um i think i think if israel had built or if israel would build some units that were more professional like that and have standing standing elite units um I think that would change the dynamic, particularly the way things are happening at the moment. You would have more of a standing reaction force at the at the level that you want them to, as opposed to always dealing with people that are half civilians going to become civilians. You, you know the mindset. So, 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 uh, you know, Israel's done a really good job of militarizing the the whole country. You know, having the country on a on a on a standby for a major war, but they almost don't have that burst energy you know at the professional level to respond to things like what's recently happened and i think um having like two or three battalions of full-time regular soldiers you know and even making I, I know i know i know the israelis use the druze and use the um the the locals but you know even making more use of palestinians which is hard but that's what south africa did we managed to turn full you know regular units actually turning what were the opposition caption guys and turning them into full-time soldiers for us? So we had, we had, we had that dynamic going on, which gave us a lot of, um, a lot of advantage in the counterinsurgency war. You know, we had like our our top counterinsurgency units had a large percentage of their soldiers were actually ex wife or ex enemy, and uh, and and that gave, you know, it gave them such an advantage in the counterinsurgency war. I know Israel's different because there is such a, but but that is one of the things that I actually noticed. There was such a such a, a a break between you know Israelis and you know the Palestinians and there there was just like this not not a I I don't know I don't know what word to use overlap or like this it's just such a such a differentiation where with us there there wasn't that and there was actually quite a quite a lot of overlap and actually even with apartheid and everything there was you know people thought this was like this um you know racist institution but the actual south african military was really well integrated now elite units were mainly black soldiers you know even black officers and um and uh and we even had more black police supporting apartheid than than, than white so it was a really complex environment but you had this like you know infiltration of the of the of the enemy which um which i i didn't get that sense of of understanding with israel you know israel i felt people were really like you know and quite rightly so, it felt that they were like completely on an island and and they were just surrounded by the enemies, but there there wasn't a, a good understanding. And, and I'm over exaggerating because I know there are some elite there are some elite Israeli units that that have the the eastern eastern you know um, um, uh, Jewish communities that you know kind of like really are well represented in the Arab community. So it's 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 not 100 percent true what I'm saying, but. I think in South Africa it was more of a there was more of a of an understanding, you know. So it is it, it is very different. And I, I just got the sense of like um I don't know, lack of understanding. And I think having having even even even, you know, like having having knowing that you have this threat to me having these like regular full time 
elite units on a standby, almost on a five four standby situation, to react really quickly to to something would would be really good. So I, I would I would be promoting a more full time military. It's hard it's hard for Israel to to I know from a mentality point of view, it's hard for Israelis to want to take on foreigners and have foreigners help them help them. You know we all know the history and Israelis want to be independent and but I think you know recruiting. Uh, professionals from from other countries would be good for Israel as well, you know, so they can know the other techniques. I mean, you know, getting guys from you know the SEALs and SAS and you know serving them because people would want to, you know, people you know identify with Israel and 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 there's a there's a lot of sympathy. So I think I think the Israelis would get much more out of doing that than than the current way where they are kind of really trying to forge their own path and and not learn lessons from other people. Uh, so I think that's the one thing I would do, you know, is to have that opportunity for but even the young Israelis to stay on like you know in in going into into full-time regiments like like you said the the overlap with the citizen force and the uh and the and the uh and the three guys like it's probably two different two different things you know so yeah I, I think that that bridge would help um that that is my big observation but also the other one was I think Israel what I saw at the time was very focused on the conventional you know being overwhelmed and the conventional all the time and and almost like the the Palestinian issues was secondary from what I saw from an equipment perspective and and tactics perspective so it wasn't seen as 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 dangerous and and I was surprised at the quality of equipment compared to the equipment that we had that that the average you know guys in the West Bank dealt with you know vehicles and you know like just that to me was really surprising um um Coming from you know us where we develop Caspers and um, you know rattles and we develop our own equipment uh, to support ourselves, learning lessons from from you know experiences. I, I just saw Israel just had bought stuff from America and everything, and I think it's really that well designed for the actual problem, you know. And I mean, like when I was serving in the West Bank, we were driving and we were like you know protecting the the local population, and we were driving little, little like. Renault, Renault cars or Jeeps or soft skinned and, and, and the opportunity for being ambushed was huge there and, and there was just no chance if something happened. It just wasn't, I don't know, to me it was just really strange and the, and the tactics and drills at the time were strange. I'm sure things have changed since then but from from the way we operate in South Africa we, there's very much a, 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 a matter of lessons learned all the time so guys would, you know, come and refine, we'd be refining things all the time and we had you know, lessons, learns opportunities, and sometimes we'd even change our tactics and and you know just from the way things happened. But I was very low level in Israel, so like I, I but I never got a sense of that. You know, like when I spoke because I, I did I spoke to reasonably high level people because I was trying to get into full time army, and we discussed tactics and things and discussed approaches, and I, I never got the sense of you know that that kind of mentality at all. I, I don't know what your thoughts are from from that perspective. I I, I mean I almost want to say that there's almost like a sense of arrogance that they know better. You know, there's always like you know, uh, you know, and also like maybe, but but deprecating on the enemy. You know, like, you know, like how bad how bad can it be, and and you know, Israel's Israel's kind of like always won all the time, so they kind of know what they're doing, kind of thing. That's I got I got that impression a lot. Yeah, no, that's all interesting. So you've raised a few points here. So um, obviously, I'm not a spokesman for the uh, for the Israeli army, but I mean, I, I can offer my opinion as someone who's been part of the system in, in yeah, the yeah, past. Yeah. Um, so with what you mentioned with the permanent force unit, so th there's, there's, there's almost a, a constant debate going on in Israel now for, for probably since the 1990s of whether the conscription model should be abandoned and if Israel should move to a kind of a permanent force army. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is that the size of Israel's population, the, the, the permanent force army would be too small for what they need. So it's, yeah. it, that's basically the reason why they haven't done it. Now, you do have certain parts of the military where you do have career soldiers, permanent force. So you, a lot of the technical guys in the Air Force, yeah, exactly. and yeah. obviously the yeah. pilots, they're yeah. all career yeah. soldiers. Yeah. Yeah. In the Navy, the crews of the ships, um, obviously they start off in national service, but many of them continue on into permanent force. Again, because you're operating sophisticated equipment, you can't have a high turnover of people because... I mean, if the guy even gets to a, a, a sort of a, a basic level of knowledge of how to operate a complex system or machinery, if he if he doesn't continue to permanent force, 
he's, mm-hmm. you've lost him, and then you have to start all over again. So they they do have those in the navy, in the special forces. Um, guys have to sign on extra time. So the national service there is three years, and in the top special forces like Sergeant Matkal and the like the equivalent of four recce or the Navy SEALs, and a few other units, guys do sign on. In my time, they used to sign on uh, one or two years. Mm-hmm. I think nowadays they sign on even more, maybe three mm-hmm. or, or four years. And so you get guys with, with quite a bit of experience there. And um, a lot of the reservists do so much reserves that they, they're they almost like a permanent force. When it comes to knowledge yeah. and capability and, and, and skills and all that stuff, they are highly skilled. But but that is in, this, in the permanent force. Um, the officers corps in the regular army are all permanent force, except for the, the very junior second lieutenants. Um, it's a problem. That one of the biggest problems is the NCOs in the Israeli army. The NCOs yes, yes. Are, are highly inexperienced, and it's yes. it's it means that is the Israeli army can't really put a lot of reliance or responsibility on their NCOs, which is yeah. different from other armies. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a huge amount of responsibility and workload that's put on your platoon commanders because your yeah. NCOs are not sufficiently experienced. Yeah. Um, that is just uh, it's part of the, it's a feature yeah. there. Yeah. Um, with the with the local serving in the unit, so you've got two sort of um, you've got different Arab ethnic groups. Mm-hmm. So three of them, three of these ethnic minorities uh, do serve voluntarily yeah. in the Israeli army. You've got your Druze, which yep. are like a almost like uh, the Druze religion is an offshoot of Shia Islam. Mm-hmm. Um, and you've got Druze who live in, in Israel, Lebanon, and Syria. And each community in each of those countries is loyal to their own government. So the Lebanese Druze are loyal to Lebanon, and the Israeli Druze are loyal to the Israeli government. Mm-hmm. Um, the the Druze used to have their own battalion. It was called the, the 299th Battalion. But at some point, the Druze said they didn't want to have their own battalion. They want to they want to serve anywhere they you know anywhere in the army. And for quite mm-hmm. a long time now, it's it's been the case. So that that battalion's been disbanded. Um, the Bedouins, um, who are sort of different, and you're going to ask me now, how are they different from the the rest of the the sort of the Israeli Arab population? Some of the differences are obvious, like they sort of a more nomadic kind of people, but yeah. um, there are other cultural differences which I'm not aware of. So unfortunately, I can't explain those differences. But the, there is a battalion of Bedouin soldiers, and um, they they've actually been fighting in Gaza now recently. But they have a they they you know they're in a very problematic position because they 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 considered traitors by the. Yep. By the Palestinians, by a lot yep. of the Israeli Arabs, and they yep. is that they relay living in this kind of a conflict. I, I, it must be very difficult for them. Um, so th- th- that's as far as the the, the Arabs. Now, the, one of the reasons why it was possible in in South Africa to have uh, your ex Swapo and and ex uh, Fapla guys and, and stuff who came over and joined uh, the South African army was because that was an ideological conflict. So an ideological conflict, you've got your communism versus uh, um, sort of democracy, et cetera, those sort of values and principles. Mm-hmm. And and it's relatively easy for someone to change sides when it's when it's yeah. when you're talking about yeah. that. In Israel, yeah. the conflict is religious. It's against radical Islam. And radical Islamists they don't change their minds very easily, so uh, you know they they don't come across so 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 yeah, much, yeah. And, and so that's that's uh, I think that's the reason why. No, no, you, you 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 you're right, and 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 we don't even want to go into 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 that discussion. It's just it's just an observation that you know why, why things were different because uh, I, I think you're probably right. The and, and, and there's 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 other reasons i think as well but we don't have to go into it. but i think i think you summarized it pretty well i mean it's not as easy as what i'm saying you know you can't just say okay we're going to have a you know like a palestinian unit obviously that's never going to happen because you know you're right those people's families live in communities which you know it's just not going to work for anybody so i don't yeah. totally understand it yeah 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 um now the the other things you you described there which are interesting is um how they you you saw 
the Israeli army operating in the West Bank and stuff in, in soft skin vehicles and, and all the rest of it. So uh, that, that's correct. That that went on. And I spent a lot of time in the West Bank. And I remember very clearly how we used to drive around in the soft skin vehicles and everything. Um, the conflict in the West Bank uh, developed. So it started off in the in the 1980s, actually December 1987, when I was in the middle of my regular in my national service. It started off as a as a kind of a um, similar to the riots that happened in South Africa, yeah. And you you had that kind of uh, level of conflict going on, and those sort of weapons that they used, they they didn't have a lot of firearms, mainly Molotov cocktails, throwing rocks. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and iron bars and, and maybe trying to drop heavy objects off roofs when the soldiers were walking underneath and things like that. And then it slowly developed. And uh, as the peace process developed, the, the the Israeli government allowed the Palestinian Authority to introduce um, small arms. And those small arms uh, then spread to other yeah. Palestinian factions and to the Hamas and then at some point, the Palestinian soldiers uh, turned against the Israeli soldiers. And then the whole sort of thing changed. And uh, it became much more lethal. And nowadays, for not only that reason, but also there's there's been a huge amount of theft of um, firearms from Israeli army bases. The Israeli army has, has done a poor job of security on their bases and and. Um, yeah. Yeah. Things are being stolen out of the bases. Like, yeah, I mean, it's mind-boggling the stuff that that yeah. that that the army has lost just to theft. It's yeah. ammunition and and firearms and and vehicles and 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 semi-trailer trucks and all sorts of things. I mean, it's yeah. it's incredible. So um, nowadays, the Israeli army on the West Bank they do use armored vehicles. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and you they don't use the soft skin vehicles anymore just because you can't. It's too dangerous. Mm-hmm. But um, mm-hmm. But definitely, I mean, that uh, what you said is, is correct. And and lastly, uh, probably the most important point you mentioned was that that arrogance that you displayed. Now, now there's something that I, I found frustrating was that there is a flaw. I mean, the Israeli army and the Israeli society, it's got it's got a lot of amazing, brilliant things, but it's also got a lot of bad things, like every society, basically. Yeah, and every yeah. society has got its strong points and its weak points. The weak point, one of the weak points of the Israeli society, there is a kind of an arrogance there where, where especially in the military when it comes to a kind of an attitude of um we've got we've got nothing to learn from anyone else that's a sort of attitude yeah and yeah. um and i uh, i came across that i mean I, I i know it's there it's there and and uh i'm sure it, it would have you, you would have come across it too and yeah. um yeah. It stems from it stems from a, a lot of things, like you say. It stems from their success. It stems from their innovation. It stems from often the poor standard of the opposition. But the opposition sometimes, you know, they have these surprises, and then, and then it catches exactly, the Israelis yeah. with their pants yeah. down, like in 1973, yeah. and yeah. now on the 7th of October. So all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it's it's definitely a feature. Yeah. Um, but um, I don't know. Was there anything that you ever saw, or, or perhaps a use of special forces or composition of special forces? Or no, I. I mean, I. I didn't have much to do with special forces when I was doing my um, uh, section leaders training. I, there were tier one guys training there at the time. I could see, you know, by the way, they were, you know, doing uh, small arms drills and everything. So there was, there was. All, all I could see is, you know, the. The type of training they were doing, weapons training. I never saw, I never saw special forces guys operating or interacted with them at all. That that's all I saw. Um, you know, I was trying to get into the special forces units, so I would speak to some leaders, um, but but I never saw how they operated or anything. But I believe, you know, it, like a lot of it is like more urban orientated. Um, you know, that 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 kind of you know urban warf- warfare, not so much the guerrilla warfare that I was trained in. And and when I did my section leaders training, I I noticed the difference in in emphasis on on you know contact drills and everything and like where we and, and we don't want to go into the Israeli drills nationally, but where in South Africa the um the the focus was on, on aggression and and uh but not but being being controlled. So you know if you hit a contact, the first thing you do is you get down and you start returning returning fire. So you win the firefight. You just you know but you don't you don't move. You 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 start winning the firefight, and then the, the the commander assesses the situation. Then he starts maneuvering his troops. So it's very maneuver orientated, and 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 we've become really good at it. 
And and then the fire and movement was very different from what the Israelis did. You know, it's individual fire and movement, cover, fire, cover, fire, and, and move forward. That that is the standard way we operated always. And um, very very aggressive and very effective. I mean, like you know, if you got in a firefight with any South African three two or those platoons, good luck to you. There's no way you're winning that. I don't think we ever got beaten in a firefight. The guys are super aggressive, well well drilled, and you know everything just kind of clicked into place. Whereas with the we had different. We got taught differently in, in 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 Israel, which which I think, I mean, Israel has has Israel loses a lot of leaders um, in 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 context from what I understand. You know, a lot of the leadership get get killed, and I think it's because of the the approach that they take, which is maybe too aggressive. Um, you know, in 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 some ways. Uh, so that's that's the comment I have on that. But I think the I think the South Africans we followed more the British approach. In South Africa, we did. You, you, you know, I think the I think the South Africa is a confounding country because, like, you know, for all the narrow mindedness of apartheid, there was all this innovation, and maybe it is reflected in like rugby and these kind of things. We do things still. We learn from other other places, but you know, like we we sent guys to Israel. Our special forces guys went to Israel and learned, uh, you know, the urban urban drills. Then came back and 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 then went to the British the SAS and. You know, and just adopted what we thought were the best, the best techniques, and of course developed our own as well. But there was that sense of, I, I never had a sense in South African Army of like, oh, let me, you know, this doesn't work. Let let's come up with a new new plan or whatever. A little bit sometimes, but you could basically innovate yourself and and pretty much get supported. And I, I even did that. Like I went against the doctrine that I was taught in the small teams, you know, like, you know, which basically saved my life as well. But you know, like I, you had a sense of innovation and. And people would ask each other, and it was almost like a, a sports team where you're just wanting to win all the time. And you know, some of the units were so superb, you know, like um, Kufut and 101 for the for the environment they were in. You know, people would we would look at Kufut and say they, you know, rebel and ill disciplined and everything, but they were so effective in the way they did things. And the kind of the leaders allowed that to happen. So we had such varying styles, and I think it also comes back from the three different conflicts we were fighting, and we kind of adapted. In real time to all of them, um, you know, we, you know, Israel's different because it's a small country and limited resources, like you said, and and maybe not such a military orientated mentality because you're you're not having guys who just want to be in the army all the time. In South Africa, had a lot of guys wanted to be just they wanted to be in the army and they stayed in permanent force and and that's what they were about. So different mentalities as well, you know, um, different culture. I mean, the cultures are so different as well. Yeah, right. Well, that's all very interesting. Um... I think I've I've covered the points that I wanted to raise. Um, do you have any more? And if, if not, then um, I guess we can finish off. No, I, I don't think so. I think um, uh, what else can we say on this topic? I think um, it, it's very difficult to discuss it unless you've been there yourself. And I wish I'd actually spent more time in Israel and been in the elite units more and had more opportunity. But it, it didn't work out. But um, but I think um, I think both. I think I think both both militaries the thing I value of both I think where the commonality is the um is the innovation on the on the lower level um leaders you know so you know guys are smart and 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 pretty innovative in how they do things um as opposed to the rigidity of the of the eastern bloc and the you know the, those kind of those kind of um you know the, those kind of cultures um I, 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 that that's where I see the commonality, you know, like like people are smart, and 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 also actually the one thing the one thing that was really common was the um, which you wouldn't expect from South Africa was actually in the elite units the ability to argue with commanders and 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 have that have that dialogue, that, that is a pretty common thing in South Africa as well, you know, even but even in the national service units you'd you'd have guys arguing with their commanders, you know, so that there was no it wasn't like the British Army where it's like completely, um, you know, rigid. There was a lot of dialogue in 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 South African Army and an argument and and in our unit, my unit, like often this the a more junior rank would be leading a, a mission uh, because he was more experienced. So rank wasn't really a big thing, and we'd also be kind of pretty much first name terms as well. So that I, I slotted into that in the Israeli Army. I really liked that immediately, even on the on the on the low, uh, you know, in the levels that I was training on. You know, you could call your commander by the first name, and and that 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 also facilitated dialogue which but it's just a pity they didn't absorb the dialogue more because actually when i was doing my basic training we had a lot of um i was with a lot of russian guys and some of them were from space nuts and uh and, and elite guys and and we were <laughs> basic training we were always having discussions with the base commander about stuff like there's always this like 
like discussion like it's, it's actually very interesting it's like almost like but nothing ever came of it you know so it would always be this like you know arguments going on and there was always the thing about discipline as well um which which is interesting in in, in that that dialogue could happen but nothing really came of it which was which is disappointing and there, and there was some like really strange things in israel which made me laugh like we would you know it's like you know, guys are lined up and then and then and then the the commander's shouting at them and then one guy would say like you know like i like stop shouting at me like you know this is unacceptable and you can't speak to us like and then the guy said like, okay you go stand there so you go stand there and then he'll carry on shouting at the people who are not complaining i was like this is ridiculous you know? so, that's israel that's, it was so funny but you know it was it was it was really interesting. It was a really interesting experience, and uh, yeah, I yeah, that's all. I yeah, no, that that is interesting. I, actually, you reminded me um, of something when I was um, the operations officer of that uh, reconnaissance battalion. We had an officer who 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 sort of um, he was a bit unusual in that he he developed an interest in sharpshooting, and and as I've explained in a previous uh, podcast, this, the Israeli army is. It's not a strong. It's not a strong. Uh, strong point of is of the IDF sharpshooter. Yeah. And yeah. like the South African army would be far superior when it comes to yeah. that. But he, this officer, said that he, he had an interest in, in in snipers and all this stuff. So he he wanted to set up in our battalion a, a kind of a sniper platoon. And he got all these. He, he he managed to get in touch with all these ex spetsnut snipers that were all around Israel. Guys who were like mm -hmm. in their thirties mm -hmm. and even in their forties. Mm -hmm. And he, he got them all together and he and there was this huge effort to try and get these guys you know into our battalion. You will not believe the 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 the, the efforts we made to try and bring them over. Like we were fighting the whole bureaucracy of the Israeli army yeah. to get this. Yeah. And then somehow the Air Force got hold of them. I don't know what the Air Force was gonna do with them. And um and then there was this battle between the Air Force and us and 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 uh in the end, we managed to get like two guys, and then, um, and it never got off the ground. It never succeeded. It was a terrible tragedy. I mean, it was a waste. It was uh, so. Yeah, the Israeli army doesn't know how to doesn't know how to uh, take that population of experienced quality soldiers, and the, and and bring them in. Another problem is is the Hebrew. So, I mean, yeah. if you'd get a guy coming from like, someone like yourself, so you spent time there and you learned the language and everything, yep, and yep, but you, yep. people who, who come over, like say, I don't know, say say uh, an American SEAL or something, he'll come over. Yep. He doesn't speak a yep. word of Hebrew. You can't fit yep. in. You you can't yep. Uh, yep. you can't. Yep. Uh, yep. Yep. So yep. the language is also an issue. But uh, yeah. know, it, it is it's it is interesting. It's very interesting. Yeah, um, you know this is. Yeah, I mean it is complicated, but this this is where you know if they did have that structure for hiring, you know, having certain units for certain functions, because you can like kind of multitask, and and those kind of functions could be, uh, you know, more for local protection or whatever. And these guys are, you know, because some guys just just are always on and paying attention. Those kind of units would be really good for you know containing situations like what happened in Gaza. Now, if you had like full time guys and that's their job and they always on standby and you have. You have fire force units, and guys would do that. You know, some guys do that. Um, I, I think I think that's where Israel's dropped the ball a lot. It's just in that complacency, you know, or you know, not not always being not always being on the gas with uh, with that. And and but it is complicated. I understand. But uh, yeah, it's um... yeah. The, the one of the 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 things which are already emerging now from what happened on the seventh of October was uh, there's a big discussion on how these um, outlying villages should be protected now so each each village had, had its own uh sort of a response squad of of people who actually lived in the village and that had served in the army or was, were even currently serving and then they were sort of formed their the, the alert squad or, or readiness squad i don't know what you'd call it um and now there's a kind of a discussion on whether there should be not only a squad in each village, but there should be a regional squad, which can also respond and move around and be mobile and, and stuff. Yep, so yep, there is yep. a whole dialogue going yeah, on now about yeah. all this thing. It's, there are going to be a lot of changes that are going to come yeah, out of this. Because yeah. one of the, the biggest incentives for for changing the Israeli army is when things go wrong and they realize they've yep, stuffed yep, up. Yep, and then yep. they, they make a lot of changes. So that's going to happen here too. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks, uh, Andre. That that was excellent. I mean, I certainly uh, thoroughly enjoyed that, and hopefully the viewers will find interest as well. And um, if cool. uh, if if we've covered everything, I guess we can sign off. Yeah, no, cool. Yeah, thanks for thanks for taking the time, and it's really been good talking to you. Excellent. Cheers. Thank you for watching. 
Please like, subscribe and ring the bell to receive notifications.